Hi there, Michael. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Uh, I thought this would be perfect for you because you are a performer in multiple genres. You performed in master classes and you're a professor at uh, what university are you at? Uh, I'm not. I retired about two oh. years ago. Maybe I should start this again. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's fine. I was at UNM, University of New Mexico, for 33 years. Oh, and I thought wow. that was enough. Wow. Yes, that's amazing. Uh, well, I, 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 um, I thought you'd be perfect for this. A few years ago, uh, one of my ex-professors gave me like a, a big box full of all these guitar review uh, soundboard magazine. Uh, you know, the magazines, like just a box full of them. And uh, I was I was going through them like crazy because this is a few years back, five, like about five years ago. And there were like old articles and there was an interesting one that uh, talked about master classes. And um, the person who wrote the article, he was an auditor at a master class with uh, Sergio Abreu from the Duo Abreu from Brazil. And the performer was playing Pavana Number no. One by Luis Milan. And um, uh, Abreu abruptly stopped the performer and he said, I don't believe in master classes. <laughs> I don't believe in master classes. I believe that you should find a really good teacher and stick with him for as long as you can. Wow. A end of master class. So, so <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah, th this was in the U.S. And, and uh, so it got me thinking about our master classes. Are they worth doing? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, of course. I mean, there's so many things that occur during a master class. Maybe the most important one is the congregation of, of talent and some maestro. I mean, that's it's fabulous. I've been a zillion of them. I've done quite a few. And it's always a, a great energy and it's always a great refresher for everybody who's in the room, including me. If I'm teaching, it, it always sparks, you know, something for me. And uh, yeah, I think it's one of the most important things that we do pedagogically. And I think, you know, my biggest influence, of course, was my teacher. I mean, uh, Bruce Holtzman was my teacher for six years, and he taught me how to play guitar. He taught me how to be. He taught me that I should drink coffee every day. He taught me that it would be cool to go look at paintings when I'm in a, another city. And, and he, you know, he really was a great, he is a great guitar teacher, as we know. So I learned how to play the guitar from Bruce, and I learned how to, I learned that interpretation, that expression, was a, a thing to to be sought for by us players. But you know, my real musical influences, probably that have carried all all my career, certainly were in master classes. You know, it was Oscar Gilia and Elliot Fisk and Michael Newman to some degree. And these people got in my life at a time when I was the most uh, influenceable. I think I just made up a word. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's lasted forever. And, and I didn't even have that many classes with them, but it was the most musically influ and expressively the most influential uh, studies I ever did. Wow. Um, I played, I, I don't have as many master classes that I've participated in in as much as you have. I, I, uh, I played for uh, Pepe Romero in 2005. And uh, I also played for, um, oh man, I forgot, I, somebody else, I forgot. <laughs> he, 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 he was a, a GFA finalist. He, he's not like, um, he's, he's not like a, a big, big title. It's not, it's, it's not like an Elliot Fisk or Hey, David Russell, it was, uh, I, I can't even think of his name. He, he's American. Um, the Pepe Romero one was great. Like it was, it, it was very inspirational. It was, it, it inspired me. It, it had me going for, for several months, but then I was like, oh man, I wish I could 
ask him some more questions or like I, I, I felt like I definitely would like to get a second or third <laughs> lesson. Like, like you leave like with more hunger, more desire for more. That that's one thing for sure. Um, and uh, I, I was I was curious because I know that when I played at my master class, I was nowhere near your level. So, do you think that master classes in the from like? Well, actually, no. How have how have master classes changed from the 70s and 80s, from when you did yours to now? Do you think uh, the standard has been lowered a little bit? Because I I I <laughs> I, I wasn't I wasn't you at that time period, or not even now. You know? <laughs> well, the great thing that's happened, and I think it's influenced the answer to your question, is pedagogy's gotten so much better over these decades that now everybody knows something. There was a time when a lot of people didn't know that much about playing. And of course, in, in America, uh, I think we're still lagging behind in pedagogy regarding expression and stylistic concerns. But in the old days, there wasn't that much discussion about that from guitar masterclass teachers in the in the in America, I think it's always I think it's been present for a long time in Europe. I mean, in Europe they just learn better. They they have a pedagogy where they they all start out with solfeggio and they they just have better teaching there. And so we always had when those guys came across the pond and did a master class. I think we always had really high level master classes. And of course, now it's better because everybody's being trained better. And so when American when an American shows up to do a master class, they're pretty well trained and they may very well have something to say. You know, it's always contingent upon how good a teacher is this person, how how adept are they at observing, uh, calculating and then responding with something useful. But I don't think they've gotten worse. They've probably gotten way better in America. Um. What advice would you give to someone preparing for a master class? <laughs> know your music. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, do, do you think that um, do you think that people play pieces at master classes that are way above their level, and maybe they should like? I mean, I mean, like little little things, little tips. Um, should they play something easy? Should they play a study? Should they play, you know? What, what do you tell your students or that you've had in the past that you sent to master classes? Like, well, my experience in three different locations, one being a former student in master classes, one being uh, a teacher in master classes, and the other being uh, a teacher who's sending a, a student to a master class. It, for the most part, it doesn't matter what you play because the maestro is going to get to the stuff that you need very likely. And so you may know the Mozart variations by Soar and you can just rip through it. And you may know the first Soar study and you can play it adequately. They're still going to find the same stuff. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what you play. It matters how well you know it. Meaning not can you play it a hundred times without, without a problem. Meaning can you see it in your head can you think through the piece hear it in your in your brain's ear do you know it that way and that was certainly the problem in my day of going to master classes and nobody had really told us yet that you needed to do that in in my case i could play sore mozart variations 300 times and then it was great and I didn't have to look at the music anymore and I could play it fine and a better example the first I think the first real master class I did in this it was in the 70s and I was a freshman at Florida State and I think it was my second quarter we had quarters there instead of semesters and Elliot Fisk came to town and you know I was making a little bit of waves in the guitar department there I just showed up in the right frame of mind, at the right time of life, with with good hands, and so it was going to be a big deal that I was going to play for Elliot, freshman. Wow! 
because there were like 40, 40 or 50 music majors there at that time on guitar. So there was a lot of guys way better than me that probably should have been up. So I played for Elliot and I had the first seven source studies ready. And, you know, I went into my lesson and played them perfect all the time. Just perfect, 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 perfect. And so I get on the on the stage with Elliot and, you know, he was unbelievably kind and patient and always has been anytime I've been around him. And then he said, oh, good. Well, why don't you just play the first one? And I started it and 10 beats into it. I didn't have any notes. There was none available. <laughs> and so Elliot had seen this before, of course, and he kindly said, well, let me show you what I think about this piece. And he played the first seven. <laughs> I think he played them all from memory. And I learned a tremendous amount from that. Probably the biggest thing I learned, well, two things. One, Elliot suggested and always has with his entire life that we play incredibly expressively, that that's more important than anything else, that the ability to play is just a given. You have the notes, fine, but now you have to make this thing happen from your spirit and your intellect. But the other thing I learned was I didn't know my music. <laughs> and so I got on I got on board fairly quickly of learning how we could learn our music better so that wouldn't happen again. So I think I'm I'm answering that that from a well I haven't told you that from the masterclass conductor's point of view I don't care what they play I, w I would like if they played something that I like I mean if somebody shows up and plays stuff that I hate it's not as fun I, I can still get to the, <laughs> I can still get to the core of what it is they need and then I'll try very hard to sense what this young player is, not only musically, but maybe spiritually, how do they feel right now? And how could I facilitate them getting what it is I'm going to say to them in a, in a better, meaningful way? And again, I don't care what they play. As a teacher who's sending a student off to a master class, of course, they need to play their best thing. And they need to know it. You know, what are the notes? My, my wife frequently sees me teach master classes and she can recite what I'm going to say. <laughs> Someone's going to play a piece. I'm going to say, well, great. Could you tell me the notes? That's a, almost every time. And in America, almost always they don't know the notes. They know how to get to them on their guitar with their fingers. But if I said, you know, well, tell me the melody. They go, of course, I could tell you the melody. All right, well, do so. <laughs> and then they can't. Again, European guitarists all can. Wow. Um, I also wanted to uh, say that you, well, ask you, you performed at the USC master classes for Andres Segovia in 1986 along with other stellar guitarists, Salif Afshar, Scott Tennant, Marcelo Kayath, and Fred Benedetti. Um, Don't forget Mary Ackerman. Oh, oh sorry. she was amazing. Oh, wow. I, I will have to look that one up. I, I did not know her. But yes, um, talk to us about the master class as well. Well, I came to that master class, how far? Probably 12 years into my career. And I was a professor already at the University of New Mexico and had been for a year. I had won a lot of competitions, including the GFA. And I was kind of, you know, I felt like a pro. And also Scott was a pro and Fred Benedetti was a, almost everybody in the class was a pro. We were certainly all finished with college. And I always wanted to play for Segovia to get the letter. I didn't care what Segovia had to tell me. I just didn't care. He was a fantastic 
artist. Don't get me wrong. I, my respect for Segovia is infinite. I didn't like his playing. Uh, do I still not like his playing? I still don't like his playing. It's not because he's not great. He's great. It's amazing. You know, you hear those early records, Capriccio Diabolico. It's like, oh, my God, nobody gets this good. You know, he had a he had a and he was brilliant. He was well trained. He knew half the famous painters who ever lived. He had a voice, a musical voice that was very interested and very. Uh, faithful to finding a way to make the guitar sound as beautiful as it could ever sound. And there's no question that he did that really well. He also had a very unique and personal view on how to play expressively. And, you know, you could never hear a Segovia record and not say, oh, that's Segovia because he had certain ways of standing on the note, of, of, uh, of playing these sort of articulations on legato moments. And he never did anything by, by error. The guy was brilliant, and I'll never be equal to Segovia in any way, except maybe girth, <laughs> if I keep getting big. <laughs> me uh, too. COVID, <laughs> COVID's been about a 20-pound augmentation for me. I got to figure out a way out of this. So don't get me wrong. My respect for Segovia is infinite. I don't really dig his playing. So when I went to the class, I went to the class because it was a rite of passage that young Amer that young international virtuosi did. You know, you, you win some competitions, you do a New York debut, uh, you get a degree, and you hope to get the letter from Segovia. You know that God has touched your brow and you'll soon be in everybody's bathroom for the rest of eternity or whatever he said. And he said really colorful things because he was a very literate and articulate and expressive speaker in, in whatever language he was he was using at the time. And yeah, I went to get the letter. I didn't get it. <laughs> I certainly didn't get the letter. You were you were on the path to being the next Christopher Parkening at the time. It, it seemed like a lot of the tickets that needed to be punched were were getting punched. And I thought there was a pretty good chance that I could be a significant American classical guitarist. And then the Segovia class ended that because as as you already know, and maybe everybody already knows, he didn't like me. He did the first lesson. There were four. Everybody had four lessons. And the first one went quite well. And the second one it was a, wasn't as good. And the third one, I changed composers because the first two were music of Manuel Ponce. And I, I decided, oh, Segovia is just too close to Ponce. There's no way I can do anything with that repertoire that he would dig. And I thought, I know, I'll play Mallorca because I play that one really well. <laughs> And that was the one that he stopped me, stopped me, stopped me, stopped me. And finally threw me out of class, which I, I don't blame him. You know, he was Segovia. It's like going to uh, uh, some billionaire, Branson, and he's going to give you a little talk about how to invest better. And then you show him the portfolio that you did after his suggestions, he didn't do any of it. That's kind of like what it was for me in Segovia. He could tell that I didn't like his playing. No, that's a little overstating my personal involvement in his thinking. He didn't give a shit about me one way or another. But he could tell from my playing that I didn't play like him. And that wasn't an accident because I played well enough that the chances are that I had some talent and some control. And so since no Segovia-isms were coming out, he could tell that I didn't, that I didn't care what he thought. He probably knew I just wanted the letter. And so he threw me out of class. I don't blame him. So you, so you think it was purely musical? It wasn't anything personal? You didn't have a run-in with him like prior to him? And 
No, he was. You, he know, was. you know, you know what they say online. I, I've I've literally seen this. Uh, if you scroll on the different masterclass ones that, you know of yours that are online, because there's there's I think there's at least like two or three published ones that are right. up on on YouTube, and someone there's always the comment. Segovia was jealous of his hair. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah there was no there was no other influence we didn't talk we didn't meet we it was only me and the other players we were only in the class with him because he was a rock star i mean he was like sting and nobody got near him except you know his friends who were also at the convention and so it was just it was just that he, he didn't have any time for this little cocky piece of shit who didn't play like him. Was there ever any contact with him after that, like between the the lessons and then after, you know, before he passed? No, no, none whatsoever. And, you know, the sum total of the event was on the positive side. You know, a lot of what he didn't like that I was doing was I was playing fingerings that were down here when he had put them up here. We all were required to use Segovia editions for for him because this wasn't the first time this happened. I mean, it happened in many classes where somebody changed his fingerings and then he got really angry. And so I brought his fingerings. I handed him his scores, but I didn't I didn't play his fingerings. I didn't know that that was a requirement. But what changed was he sort of when I started playing. My teacher Bruce Holzman was all about Segovia style fingerings and playing. And I learned to play that way and I, I loved it. And, you know, we all try to make big, thick, fat tone. And and that's how I started. And then as years went by, all, all 10 years or whatever it was, I decided I liked the clarity of playing on higher strings. And that was just a temporary enchantment that I had. But when Segovia, uh, insisted that I consider his fingerings, and he didn't do that in a in a conversation. He threw me out of class, and I had to think. Well, what did I do wrong? Oh, he didn't play his fingerings. Oh, it sounds like kind of good up here. You know, the B string sounds better than the E string, and so I did start using more of the guitar's nuances and voices, I started using them again uh, within a year or two of the Segovia event. And that stayed with me now. I, I still play very much Segovia-like fingerings. Was that because of him or was it a decision that an artist would inevitably come to who wants to make your instrument sound beautiful? Probably the latter, but I got to give him a little credit. I mean. I wouldn't even have known to play up the neck if he hadn't done it all of his career. And my teacher, Bruce Holzman, hadn't done it in his career and showed it to me. So, yeah, I give him cred. But it ended my career as a classical guitarist. That was the end. And I knew it was when he do it, when he threw me out, I knew that was the end. And it was a it was a powerful delivery of grief to a person who had up to that point, only had joy and success. You know, I won everything I ever entered. Everybody was nice to me. Everybody liked the way I played. And all of a sudden, the most important human in my field did something that I could never recover from, politically and career-wise. And so that was it. I went home to New Mexico, and uh, concerts started being canceled. People didn't call me back. Management went away. It was it was devastating. What did you do? What? Because uh, uh, after you lost everything, and you obviously have gone in different directions, like uh, like uh, come together, like that arrangement with the the drumming, Ringo's drumming that you're doing on the back of the guitar on the sides and and the taps on the top. It's just. Uh, what was it was like a rebirth for you? How, how did you go into that? Desperation. And uh, also, you know, Segovia 
That event kind of helped me redefine what I liked about music and about being a musician. And when I grew up, of course, I listened to pop music like everybody, like everybody does. And then I got to college and I decided that I was going to wear the uniform. I sold all my rock and roll gear. I sold all my records of rock and roll and, and literally moved through life as if I were a person who had grown up, you know, in Manhattan and had a great maestro and was a, a, a solfeging classical musician from the beginning. I wasn't, but I wanted to be. And so I took that persona on probably until the Segovia event. And at that moment, it was like, I'm bullshitting everybody. I'm not that guy. I, I you know, listen to classical music everywhere. When I get in the car, you know, I'd listen to rock music always. I love rock music. And so then it occurred to me, well, what if I, what if I played it? I don't want to be in a band, so I'm going to have to figure out a way to make it happen on one guitar, on one pass, because I want to be able to do it in public. And the first tune, uh, I don't have a strap. Uh, the first tune was, wait a minute, let me put the desk down so I can sit. Slight technical adjustment here. This is the greatest invention, by the way. Get a, get a lifty desk. It helps your back. You can't, sit all, you can't sit all day. You got to stand. So it was this tune. I mean, it's one of the iconic moments in music. Soon, more than words by extreme, extreme. yeah and you know it was two guys on a video two handsome beautiful men with long hair one a great guitarist you know Betancourt was an amazing guitarist he's an amazing guitarist to this day and of course Chiron is a fantastic singer but what a great song I mean it was a great song I loved it and I thought well, if somebody could do this thing, because Betancourt thought to use this backbeat thing, you know, where you slam your thumb against the E string. I, I, I guess he might have slapped all of his fingers. I'm, I'm not sure, but either way, it does the same thing. We're trying to imitate a snare drum. Snare drum happens on two and on four. And so that I could get right away. I thought if a guitarist could do that, and play the melody, not sing it, but play it. That guitarist would be the most famous guitarist in the world for at least a while. And so I learned how to go. And to my knowledge, I don't think anybody had done that yet, where you keep the backbeat going, because it's a little bit of a challenge to play a melody note while you're doing this and in inevitably a note uh, a, a melody note is going to happen on beat two or four so you're going to have to either keep the slap going which nobody had done people had done this kind of playing before but when the slap happened when the when the backbeat happened they either moved the melody note to another place like i can't even do it anymore maybe leave the melody note out or they would leave the slap out they go and I thought I'm going to learn how to do that and so what I did I would still pluck the note in a traditional way where you are flexing the fingers and then I would slap at the same time and, and that worked fine and I made a video of it and it worked. But then one day I thought, well, wait a minute. What if I keep the hand always moving in the same way? So when the thumb slaps, I don't have this contrary motion of thumb rotating uh, clockwise and the finger going counterclockwise. So I thought, 
I'll just get real precise and whack the melody note with my index fingernail while the whole hand is turning in that direction. Oh, wow. And it worked great, and I did it on everything that needed it. I wouldn't do it like on the Chaconne or anything, but I, I did it on all pop music that had a snare drum. And I made a video. This was before YouTube was a big thing. It was one of the first videos on YouTube. I made the video, and I put it out there, and I forgot about it. And then somebody said, oh, your arrangement of more than words has gone viral. So first of all, what is viral? And then I learned what that <laughs> was. And they said, oh, by the way, it's not your video. There's an eight-year-old kid in Korea named Sung Ha Young who copied your video and gave you credit for the arrangement. But he's the one that's got 75 billion hits and good luck with your shitty career. <laughs> <laughs> and so Sunga is, you know, one of the most famous guitarists in the world. And uh, he covered a few of my arrangements on the way to his fame. But I didn't get I didn't get to be the greatest guitarist in the world. Well, here's a, here's another question for you. Um, where do you think this is all going? Where do you think the future of classical guitar is going? Do you think it's going in direction of more like uh, instrumental pop? Like that uh, Milos, um, are you familiar with, uh, it looks like Milos, but he, he, you know, as people say, Milos, Kerala, Digilac, or something like that. And oh, he's, he's uh, he, huh? You got to send me a link. I will. He uh, he made a, an album of uh, Beatles covers. Well, I mean, everyone has covered the Beatles, but he's also, he's done more of that, like, you know stuff of like you know arrangements of pop songs for guitar do you think do you think the guitar classical guitar is going in that direction or where do you think it's going well i think it's going in a direction where it'll continue to imitate its its past you know we still have for the most part people playing classical repertoire with very traditional excellent technique and good musicianship skills, mostly playing music written by someone else. And the someone else oftentimes doesn't play the music they wrote. They give it to some, you know, guitar virtuoso to play. So nothing's, it hasn't changed that much. You know, there's been an occasional, th there are some composers who are good guitarists. You know, Dion's was probably the first, well, Bogdanovich, uh, th there are many, but Dion's was the first to really get super played by everyone. I mean, I don't think there's a classical guitarist on earth who doesn't play a Dion's piece. And way too many who play Fuoco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that that hasn't happened that much. You know, most of the really super virtuosi I think of in the world are playing covers of of classical musicians. They're all covers. I mean, when the London Symphony plays Beethoven's Fifth, they're being a cover band, you know, top cover band, but they're playing a cover. If you didn't write it, it's a cover. Not that that distinction really matters in the classical world. So I don't see it changing at all. It's it's kind of going on. I mean, yeah, we've got like uh, Assad, Sergio Assad, one of the greatest guitarists who ever lived, happens to be one of the greatest composers who ever lived, and bam. You get, you get all of that in one guy, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty rare. So I don't think the classical guitar is changing at all. Plus, there's a, there's a pedagogical society of classical guitarists who are teaching classical guitar, and they're not particularly interested in it becoming something other than what they studied and they're good at. And that's just human nature. I mean, that's why we still have fighter jets. You don't need fighter jets. You have missiles. Missiles, nobody gets hurt from your side. It can hit any target, you know, within a square inch. And you don't need fighters. The only reason we have fighters is because Air Force and Navy and Marines are full of older guys who were fighter pilots. So they want to have more fighter pilots. Same with classical guitarists. Interesting. Wow. Well, thank you, sir. Oh, Thank my you pleasure. so much, and uh, it was amazing to talk to you and, and hear your perspective on these things.
Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.